very excited to have Chad Jackson here today. Um, we are going to get started. Okay, so Chad da Jackson, our Associate State Archaeologist for San Luis Obispo Coast District, uh, is joining us today for our Mind Walk. And um, I'm just going to read the description for the, for the talk today, and then we'll roll right in. So archaeology in San Luis Obispo County continues to provide evidence of California Native American presence going back at least 10,000 years. The preservation of archaeological deposits is crucial for ar archaeologists to study past human life in many different factors, contribute to the creation and destruction of the archaeological record. Chad will provide an overview of the various periods of cultural development over the past 10,000 years on the Central Coast and how environmental changes such as climate and human impacts have shaped it. Chad will present the archaeological framework used to describe these periods and how archaeologists interpret their scientific data. Thank you so much, Chad. I'm going to go ahead and mute my mic and it's being passed over to you. Thank you. Thanks, Robin. So how's it going, everybody? Um, I'm honored to be here to present to you all in these interesting times. I'm glad that we're still able to connect with, with all of you. Um, yeah, so as Robin mentioned, my name's Chad. Um, I am the archaeologist for the Southern Swiss Coast, Coast District State Parks. Uh, I have been doing archaeology for about 15 years. I attended Cal Poly. Uh, and studied, I actually started studying electrical engineering and had a, a bit of a, a young life crisis and I, I quit and traveled and I came back to study earth science and anthropology. And uh, I started working actually for state parks in 2004, um, doing as a park aide and I started helping out with the biologists doing mapping. And as I graduated and got into archeology, span I, I started working for Elise Wheeler, who was the former archeologist that held my current position. And uh, then I went on a little stint doing environmental consulting. And that was really cool. I got to travel all over the state uh, working on solar projects and wind farms. And I worked on the Los Osos sewer project and that was uh, probably the most intensive archaeological excavations that have occurred around Moore Bay on Los Osos. So that was a really good project, a great experience. And I was working um, and studying under Terry Jones, who is the Cal Poly professor of archaeology, and he's uh, quite famous for California archaeology. So he is one of the, um, the most renowned and also the most highly published archaeologists in the state. And um, then in uh, November 2018, I, I acquired my current position. So I'm really happy to be working for state parks. We do a lot of interesting things, um, managing the cultural resources and the archaeological sites, as opposed to the private consulting world, which tends to work with development. So you're, you're working with developers, whether it's um, necessary stuff like roads and infrastructure to obviously housing and stuff like that. So I really have to be, be working um, as more of a cons cons conservation aspect of archeology. span um, So archeology span in, in San Luis Obispo County and in Central California in general, um, doesn't go far as far back as some of the other regions um, in the country. Um, it really started in the mid 1900s. Before that, um, I'd say at the turn of the century, there was interest in uh, California Native American archeology, span more from the perspective of collectors. Uh, a lot of the sites around the state were um, picked over by museum collectors and people who were looking to acquire those. Archeology, span as I was saying, um, started in the mid 1900s in, in San Luis Obispo County. And a lot of it was people just collecting artifacts from the sites. And what happened is we had several eth ethnographic studies and ethnographers that um, documented 
what was happening at the turn of the century and in the early 1900s. And we had J.P. Harrington who interviewed and worked with several Shumash people who had still had knowledge from um, the olden days. And then we had um, A.L. Kreber who wrote the handbook of California Indians. And through this work, especially Kreber's work, they found that there was over 100 languages spoken in California which essentially made it the most linguistically diverse region in the entire world, which is pretty remarkable because it's a big, the world is a big place and there's a lot of different Native American tribes and cultures, but for some reason, California had the most diverse linguistic um, geographic range and partly due to the diversity of the landscape. So uh, I'm going to pull something up here for that. Anyways, not seeing it. So, um, so here in San Luis Obispo County, once they started doing some real archeological work, they, they discovered that uh, the sites go back at least 10,000 years. So one of the biggest things that people always ask me when uh, we're talking about archeology span is how old is it? So I know many of you who, who have an interest in archeology span probably think the same thing. Like one of the, one of the most interesting things and also for archeologists is how old are, are we talking about? Like what, what time period does this site or does that artifact pertain to? A lot of what we know from the California Native American um, informants was what was happening during the time of European contact and afterwards. But what about all the 10,000 years before that? What was going on? And so that's where archeology span comes into play because as you know, the California Native Americans didn't have a written language. So we can only learn from the past through the study of archeology. span And so that is where archeology span has taken off in working not only with scientific community, but also with the tribes and, and helping to work with tribes and tell them about their past because they know things through their oral traditions. A lot of those were lost during the um, transition to uh, Americanization and the, through the mission system. So now we're able to work with the tribes and with other archeologists to sort of corroborate all our data and come up with these histories of a people and a place. And even, even the descendants of those people are actually oftentimes very interested to know what, what their ancestors were doing. And to know that this history goes back 10,000 years is, is quite remarkable. And so what I was uh, mentioning on my introduction was that the only way that we're able to study any of this stuff is if there is an archeological record. So an archeological record is sort of a general term, meaning everything that archeologists can study about a people. So it's all of the collective archeological sites in a region and the deposits. So it really comes down to archeological deposits, which are essentially the physical remains of past human life. So it comes to um, the question of how do archeological sites form? Um, you can sort of guess that, yeah, over time, we drop all of our stuff, we throw things away, and it just gets built up. But how do, how do things result in being five feet underground? The people didn't necessarily dig holes and bury everything. So what we're talking about is archaeological site processes and archaeological site formation. And so this is an important thing for management, for my position. So um, well, I just wanted to kind of go over this um, to hopefully it's informative to, to you guys. The, um, so how does an archaeological site form? So we have, um, we have sedimentation and the soil, the development of soils. So cultural materials that are laid down on the ground 
over the course of time become incorporated into the soil through basic concepts such as sheet wash. Think about every time it rains, there's a thin layer of silt that gets washed over the land. You do that thousands and thousands of times and slowly the soil gets thicker and thicker and those materials that were laid down by humans become incorporated into that soil. You also have plants that are growing. They grow, they move the soil, they decay, and that is contributing to the soil development. You also have um, you know, larger events like floods or landslides and sometimes uh, intentional burying. Um, let me share my screen here with you guys for a second. Um, good. So here is a um, here is a shell midden. Uh, it's actually in Los Osos, out on the sand spit, and along the sand spit, you have sand is moving around constantly. So in a sand dune context, you can really see how things are buried quite quickly. Most places this does not occur this rapidly, but every spring you have the wind blowing and the sand will just bury things. And in fact. Things are moving so much out there that we're often seeing sites uh, being exposed. Um, shell midden scatters like what you're seeing here in this image. And then the next spring, it's gone because it got buried by sterile sands and you can't see it anymore on the surface. So, so these are some of the concepts that um, contribute to the, the formation of these sites. You also have fire hearths. If you think about all the fires, every night you have a fire and fires are dug down into the ground and everything that's burned is the food that you're cooking and and anything else that was thrown in there gets incorporated into that fire pit and then when you put the fire out you might bury it and so you have just the this accumulation of all these fire hearths over time and that is oftentimes where you find some of the best um, archaeological deposits because for instance if the if uh, a people hunted and killed, say, some rabbits and a, and a deer, and then they cooked them in the fire, uh, the bones, some things will be tossed back in. And then even the arrowhead that they shot the deer with, oftentimes that wasn't retrieved. They would sort of offer that arrowhead to, um, to not be used again. It did its job. It provided them with a meal. They'll let that arrowhead um, go with the body. So you have this accumulation of tools and things that are found in those fire hearths. So those are very important um, features when we're doing archaeological excavations and we find a, an intact fire hearth. It's a, a very important thing that we usually move very slowly and methodically when we're excavating those. Um, so um, the other question now I have is how do archaeological sites not form? So when an archaeological site is not forming, then there's something happening in that environment that's preventing an archaeological deposit from being preserved, such as erosion, or um, maybe a wildfire comes through and you know burns all of the organic materials that would have been preserved otherwise. Lithic artifacts, rocks, um, things made out of stone, preserve quite well, obviously through fires and, and whatnot. But um, um, an important thing to, to, to think about is uh, when you're when you're thinking about how archaeological sites form, how they're preserved, and as an archaeologist, you're looking for those places. And if we're in a situation to where there is a, an archaeological site that we are trying to manage, and it's being destroyed, such as through erosion, um, we need to manage for that. So here we have Spooner's Cove. And if any, any of you have been out there in the wintertime, you know how big the waves are. I love to surf out here um, for that same reason. And here we have archaeological sites all the way up to the edge of the, the bluffs. And the wave activity is constantly hammering away uh, at the ed edge of that, um, the bluff edge. And if you can see the little island here, 
in Spooner's Cove. I'm sure many of you are familiar with this little island. Um, it, I'm not sure how far back, but about 30 years ago, it was connected to the land. Um, to the right, you can see the little people down there. That was a, a little land bridge. And so it was part of the landform to the right. But just in our lifetimes, we've seen this erosion and archeological deposits that were present there are, are gone. They're washed away. So this is the type of situation to where if we're interested in studying that, we, you need to address these issues because every winter that archaeological deposit is, is disappearing. So in some cases, um, archaeological sites that were recorded in, say, the mid-20th uh, century are, are now gone. And unless the archaeologists were able to conduct some, some mitigation to retrieve data, because the site was disappearing, um, we're no longer able to learn of, of what that archeological site had to teach us. And so we've conducted multiple excavations um, in Montana de Oro due to this um, loss of those archeological resources. And um, so this kind of brings me to the next uh, concept to think about it, and that is, um, what has happened over thousands and thousands and thousands of years? Because we know that the archeological sites go back at least 10,000 years. So here in this image, you can see the land has been at the current, uh, sea, the sea level has been at the current um, level for you know, roughly 6,000 years. But if you go further back in time, and especially when you get to that 10,000 year mark, that was at the end of the last glacial maximum. So the ocean levels were down up to 300 feet lower than they are now. So if we're looking at this image and we see the, the, the ocean off to the left, the land that we're looking at would have been 300 feet above the ocean level. So that means that all the land that is now underwater out where the surf's breaking, all those wonderful surf spots that we have, those would have been headlands and they would have been the location of prehistoric activity. So that brings up the question of, well, are there archeological sites that are offshore that are now submerged? The wave activity and the sort of harsh conditions of the ocean probably have not been gentle on those potential archaeological sites that, that are offshore. But it really brings that question into, into play. And there are places where offshore underwater preservation uh, conditions are, are much better for preservation. And we do have underwater archaeological sites, places where um, maybe you're, you know, in the lee of the prevailing winds and waves. And um, I don't think Montana de Oro would be one of those areas. Although I'm sure there's plenty of artifacts out there. I'm just gonna pull up something here. Okay, I'm gonna show you a different image. Let's talk about this concept. Um, share this image. So here we have, um, that's the campground, Spooner's campground down below. We have the, if you look at the flat ridges above the campground, what you have there is a sequence of marine terraces. Each marine terrace was carved by wave activity. So similar to the previous image that showed the flat bluff, that was the last most recent marine terrace that was carved out at the last glacial interglacial period like we are now so if you to imagine just offshore of spooner's cove from that last image the waves have flattened everything underwater through their activity and created like the beach and just that flat area and then so when the sea levels go back down during a glacial period that land becomes exposed again 
that was formerly flattened by the wave activity. And then as the geologic uplift occurs slowly, 100,000 years later, when the ocean levels finally come back up, because the, we're in an interglacial period, that previously flattened beach that we were imagining that was just offshore is now higher than it was before. And so the ocean can't get to it. So that is now elevated above the sea level and its process starts again. And the ocean and the wave activity is starting to flatten a new area immediately offshore. And so what you have over say a million years, you have a sequence of different glacial periods and interglacial periods where the sea level was low and things allowing the land to lift up over a hundred thousand years. And when the sea level, the polar ice caps melt and the sea level rises again, it comes back and is not able to get back to the former terrace and it starts a new one. So you have basically, it's like a staircase. So if you see, we have this flat area up to the top right was an ancient marine terrace and the flat area just below that is the next marine terrace in sequence. And then you go back down and what you're seeing down by the campground is more of the stream terrace from the Islay Creek. But if you were to look out of the photo to the right, you would see the current bluffs that we go walking on our hikes out around Spooners. And that is the most recent marine terrace. So these marine terraces were the locations most likely of where humans would, would settle. So people haven't been uh, around in Montana de Oro for longer than the last marine terrace, like I said, 10,000 years. So if you go to a place like say Africa, you know, you might have archeological sites on all those different marine terraces. So uh, a bit of a rant there, apologize. I was, I was getting a little carried away, but um, just something that I like to think about is um, the people living back 10,000 years ago would have probably saw the sea level rise and watched things slowly become flooded and they had to retreat further inland as the ocean levels rise. Um, not to stir up any uh, conspiracies about global warming or anything, but um, since we are in this um, more rapid sea level rise situation nowadays, we're seeing those effects. The sea level is rising and it's obviously exacerbated by human activity. This isn't so the glacial interglacial cycle has been doing this on planet earth for, for millions and millions of years. But now we're in a situation to where it has been sped up. So, uh, so much it's happening so much faster because of, um, global warming and whatnot. So the sea levels are rising. We're seeing some of these archeological sites being impacted um, by the erosion. And another thing to think about is all the rivers in the West have been dammed. All those rivers used to produce sediment. Every time the rivers would, would flood, all that sediment would wash into the ocean and it would all come down, it would come south through the prevailing currents and it would build up on the beaches and all that sand protected the bluffs from wave activity. Now that we have no more sediment being produced because all the rivers are dammed, the wave activity over the last 50 years has stripped the sand away and now you have less of a buffer and the waves and now come all the way up to the edge of the bluff and erode the bluff. So we have um, a lot of enhanced erosion that's occurring now. And that's, like I had said, that's one of our, um, our issues when we're trying to manage these wonderful archeological sites that we'd like to preserve as much as possible for the public to enjoy and for the tribal people to, um, to be able to um, have those ancestral grounds preserved in, in a park. And so um, moving on, so, so as I was mentioning, all this 10,000 years of, of prehistory is, is preserved in these archeological sites, but how do we know how old things are? That's such a big, important thing. So 
archaeological dating is, is one of the most important things that we do as archaeologists in our research. And um, so there's many different forms of, of dating, many different dating techniques. Um, this is an artifact that I found on one of my surveys up, up north. And uh, this would be known as a diagnostic artifact. So diagnostic artifacts are something that have been um, an artifact style that has been placed into a certain time period where they say people were only making this style of artifact for a short amount of time in history. And when we say short, you know, maybe it was a thousand years. That's still a really long time. But, um, and so they had to have um, been able to cross-reference the presence of that artifact with another dating style because the first person to find that artifact still needs to know how old it is. So we have something called relative dating. And that is where you know the age of something and you're inferring that the object that is found with that other thing is the same age. So there's several ways we can do that. Um, but it usually falls upon the second type of dating, which is direct dating. And that is where you have the radiocarbon dating um, and something that you folks may or may not be um, knowledgeable of, and that is dendrochronology. Dendro meaning trees, chronology being time. So, and it's based on tree rings. So they've been able to study the sequencing of tree rings and the widths. And because of the fact that trees essentially record the environmental conditions every season that they grow, they've been able to sequence out the widths of the tree rings to provide almost a calendar. And that signature can be applied to wood. So if you find, say you're in the Southwest and you have, you know, a Pueblo, ancestral Pueblo ruin and they have wood that they built their um, building with, you can study the wood, study the tree rings and find the sequence of the tree rings and place it on that calendar and go, oh, based on these tree ring um, widths and the sequence, we can see that this was, this tree was growing in 500 AD. From 500 to 550 AD is when this tree was growing. And so they can now say that that tree must have been harvested around 550 AD and built into this building. So everything that we find with that, that was built at the same time as that tree, or that piece of wood is also around 550 AD. So that's a, so that is the use of the dendrochronology as a direct dating technique, and then the relative dating of associating other things with that tree ring. Um, there's also volcanic ash, we have, which is a relative dating technique. We, we know certain volcanoes erupted during certain times, maybe, um, you know, Mount St. Helens in 19, whenever that was, 1903, or, and it laid down the volcanic ash. So if you go to a soil profile and you find that volcanic ash, you know, okay, that represents 1903. Anything above it is younger. Anything below it is older. Same goes for the San Francisco, uh, San Francisco earthquake that was followed by those immense fires of 1906. So when they do uh, historic archaeology in San Francisco, when they find this rubble and ash layer, they know, oh, we just got to 1906. They know everything below it is, is older than 1906. Everything above it is younger. So that's another technique. And then, of course, the, the most reliable tool for archaeologists is radiocarbon dating, which utilizes radioactive, radioactive um, carbon-14. I'm going to show you guys this image. And this is a, uh, this is some um, radiocarbon results from a, uh, I'm going to be using um, a site in Morro Bay and an archaeological study that was done sort of to, for examples on today's presentation. So this was um, a, a study done by Terry Jones, Cal Poly. Um, this is from a state park archaeological excavation. 
So we, we had 11 radiocarbon samples from marine shellfish and all the ages on the right were calibrated based off of what is called radiometric dating. And that is you calculate, this is going to be a brief run through for radiocarbon just um, since it's really interesting, but I will get into a whole nother lecture specifically about dating techniques and a lot, a lot of the technology that's used um, at a later, uh, 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 later presentation, but for today, I'll just briefly go over just to, um, in case anybody's wondering the carbon 14 dating utilizes, um, carbon has 12, uh, electrons normally and, um, 12 neutrons and protons. So a radio radioactive carbon has 14 neutrons. So it has two extras. And what happens with any, um, radioactive, uh, element is the, it's unstable. So over time, the radioactive atoms break down, they release those extra particles and it produces radioactivity. And it's all over through the environment. This isn't the type of carbon 14 isn't really dangerous, but animals and plants sequester radioactive carbon throughout their life cycles. It's present everywhere in the water and the, in the air and the food that we eat. And so when you incorporate carbon 14 into your, into your tissues, into your skeletal system, mainly it never leaves your body. Once you acquire it, it stays with you. It doesn't, you, you don't release it through um, our biological processes. So the only way that say a plant, um, or an animal gets rid of it is they die. So when you eat an animal or you eat your pl the plants, you're acquiring all of the radiocarbon uh, that that plant or that animal had in their bodies and you, and you incorporate into your body. And so you keep acquir acquiring more and more and more throughout your life cycle until you die. Then you stop acquiring carbon 14 and that's when the, the clock starts for, um, for radiometric dating. So once, an animal or plant has died there's a fixed amount of carbon 14 in their bodies and that carbon 14 starts to break down in a consistent rate carbon 14 has what's called a half-life many of you are probably aware of this but of what a half-life is but half of the radioactive carbon will have broken down within that time and that time is 5730 years so based on those numbers we use um, the laboratories test the amount of radiocarbon that is present in the tissues of this sample. And this is the tricky part. Then they compare it to how much radioactive carbon should have been in this tissue had it not broken down. So in essence, they're trying to calculate how much radioactive carbon was present when the thing died and how much is present now. And the difference there tells you the age. So as you can see, it's a little bit um, reliant on other data, such as how much is supposed to be in this animal at the time that they died. And that's done through a bunch of other science that we won't get into. But that's es essentially how it's done, and it's very important. So this is, um, okay, I'm back. Um, I will go into this now, just a quick little, uh, description of it just to let you look at this um, and this is sort of how we interpret the data and this is how terry jones interpreted the data here radiocarbon assays and i can just kind of let you guys look at that while i'm, I'm talking here um, so that's a dating technique the radiocarbon so once you have radiocarbon dates for certain um sites say we um we use the radiocarbon dates from this site. We can see that they're all around 5,800 BC, 5,000 BC. Once we know that this deposit is this old, then we can start looking at the artifacts that were found in this deposit and say, hey, this style of arrowhead was made between 5,000 and 5,800 BC. Now we can basically, if we don't see that type of artifact, earlier than 5,800 BC, and we don't find that type of artifact 
later in other archaeological sites that are dated to different time periods, we can say that's a diagnostic artifact. That artifact was made in 5,800, 5,000 BC, approximately. Uh, most of the stuff, when it comes to diagnostic artifacts, they're approximate because, you know, if you find an artifact, the same artifact that dates to a much later time period, then you kind of threw off the whole theory and archaeologists need to um, go back to the drawing board. But, and that happens all the time. But what we have, um, importantly around here is shell beads and these shell beads were made in many many different ways so this is another diagnostic artifact that when we're doing our studies we're looking for those artifacts those are the ones we want to find because this before you even do any radiocarbon or do any testing if you can find a certain bead style then you can gives you a a head start you go oh we found uh you know what does it say here an olivella barrel bead we already know that those barrel beads were produced you know at this time period so that it kind of gives you a general idea oh i think we're dealing with uh, um this time period and then of course as time goes on bead styles change and so just based on beads alone we can say a lot about uh the age of these archaeological sites. Okay, so um, there's other radiometric techniques as well, and this is, is really really interesting. Um, there's potassium argon dating, and that's the radioactive potassium, and it it can be used to date things really really old. It's not of use in archaeology, but for it has a half life of I think 1.25 billion years. So very helpful in paleontology and geology dating. Um, but back to, um, so what, are all this, what is all this dating? What, what do all these dates tell us? So basically now that archeologists know how to tell how old something is, they have several different ways to cross-reference how old something is. You have the radiocarbon dating, there's also um, obsidian hydration dating, thermoluminescence dating, um, bunch of different styles so if you can cross-reference multiple different dating techniques and they all corroborate or they all point to the same time period then you can your confidence goes up you go not only do the radiocarbon results tell us that it's 5,000 years old we also have the shell beads that are from that time period we also have these arrowheads that um, are only found during this time period we also have obsidian hydration results that are saying the same age so now we're pretty confident in what we're saying about the site and how old it is. So once we have a sequence for a region, you have to study a lot of different archaeological sites to figure out what the different sequence throughout the 10,000 years was. And that's when it, we come to something called a cultural chronology. And that is essentially the change of a culture through time. So here on the Central Coast, we have developed cultural chronologies and I'm going to show you Actually, what I'm going to do, I'm going to do this real quick. Oops, let me pull this up. So I forgot to put this on there. Well, let me do something. Nice. Sorry for that little hiccup. Um, let me show you something here. Um, so the the study that was done that this example that i'm showing you all those radiocarbon results showed us that this site was occupied 5800 bc to 5000 bc which is pretty old what's also interesting about it was that it the deposit was basically all from that time period so that is very very unique to have a site that has 
most of the entire deposit dates to 5,800 BC is 7,800 years ago, about 8,000 years ago. And this is right here in Morro Bay. I mean, this is right there. So what we're seeing is that why was there so much happening 8,000 years ago? What about all the time from 8,000 years ago to now? How come there is more going on back then than there was, say, 5,000 years ago or 4,000 years ago? So that's just one of the big questions that we have. We, we don't know. We have to study it to figure it out. But it's very interesting to, to know that there was such a large presence of, of human activity going back that far. Because you would think that it would be continuous. You would think, oh, you're going to have you know, 8,000 years ago, and you're going to have stuff from 6,000 years ago, stuff from 5,000, 4,000, and so on and so forth. But really, what we're seeing is that it's not that way. You have this huge deposit dating to 8,000 years ago to 7,000 years ago, and then you have nothing for 7,000 years. And then you have this, they also found that there was a thin deposit on the surface of this archaeological site that dated to much more recent times, like, um, around the 1700s but what happened between the 1700s and 7,000 years ago um, basically the site just wasn't occupied they weren't hanging the people weren't hanging out there so it's just very interesting um, okay hold on a second find my uh, document here Okay, I'm going to share with you guys. So this is the uh, this is the temporal sequence for Central California. So what we have is the last ten thousand years, or it says eleven thousand years here, have been broken into all these different time periods. So at the oldest, we have the the, the arrival of people, and it, it's called the Paleo Indian period or the Archaic period. And what was happening back then is this is when you have those Clovis cultures, the hunting. We're talking about, you know, people that were hunting large animals such as woolly mammoths and uh, following the game around. And then you have the next time period, which is the milling stone period. And this period is when we have the 8,000 to 7,000 year time frame that our site in Moore Bay is pertaining to. So this is, it's called the milling stone period because what you have in the artifact assemblages, in other words, the tools that we find in these sites were primarily grinding stones, meaning that the people weren't eating acorns. It's not a bowl and mortar. It's a flat grinding stone or a matate. So they were eating seeds. And, you know, nowadays we have this whole craze over chia seeds. Everybody's putting it in their yogurt or whatever, but the, native Californians were eating chia seeds and all these other seeds, grass seeds. So they weren't eating acorns. They were targeting these grasslands. And we know that grasslands proliferate when there's wildfires. So they were probably performing prescribed burning 8,000 years ago to promote these grass seeds. And you also have very large projectile points. So they're definitely still hunting large game. But this milling stone period was a very unique uh, period in um, California when there was a lot of activity and a lot of things happening. So it's possible that other cultures from the new world, such as um, Mesoamerica and, and elsewhere, were the result of people who were living in California in the milling stone period and then moved out. Since we have a ton of sites that were dating to this period, and it was a very productive uh, environment and then you have the early period which isn't the earliest it's called the early period because this is you have a lot of sites in our, our county that date to this early period and this is when you start having bowls and mortars used to to harvest acorns so they shifted their food subsistence to oak trees which are found everywhere so um, then you have the middle period when things started to become more complex the society started to um, 
work together and create more of a um, social stratus, um, social, so, social um, hierarchy. And then in the middle eight transition period, if you guys can see that right there where it says 1,000 to 700 years before present, this is when there was a lot of change in California. There was droughts and particularly the Shumash elevated their society to become very, very uh, uh, separated so that you had no longer this egalitarian situation where everybody was sort of like a um, jack of all trades to where you had very specialized roles in society. And so this middle eight transition period was when you started to have these different villages and trade networks and production areas and people specializing. And so this, the society became very complex. And then you have the late period, which um, saw many things happening with um, the um, net trade networks throughout the whole state. And this is the time period that was encountered by the Spanish when they, when they um, made contact in 1769. Um, and these were the cultures that we learn about through our ethnographic work. And you also have this proto-historic meaning that is, it is sort of a transition period between people living ancient traditions and the Europeans arriving. So there was some written history. There was a lot of things happening where native people were using modern technology of the 1700s, such as, you know, guns, there was glass, there was all these different um, materials that they were able to use. And they somewhat had this hybrid uh, society where they were still using traditional techniques, but also utilizing European technology. And then the three other periods of the mission period, Mexican and American. So there's our, there's our cultural um, temporal sequence. And so in Central California, what we have is um, certain areas have certain areas, um, you narrow it down and you say, okay, in Morro Bay, we have this overall temporal sequence, and then we have cultures that we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna describe, such as the one at Morro Bay of the the example I've been showing you guys, and that may create a whole new title that we're gonna say we call it the Morro Bay phase or something. And so you have phases, and these are basically cultures, individual cultures that are represented through an archaeological site, and um, we have um, we have uh, something here that we can be um, using to talk about these different um, phases. And so here's all these different names of all these different archaeological phases throughout California. And I'm going to just kind of scroll through to get to one that um, relates to us. So right here in the middle, um, if you guys can see where it says Diablo, that was based off of the Diablo Canyon archaeological excavation. And everything that they found within that, that excavation, they were able to date between 8,000 and 3,500 BC. And so now in, in San Luis Obispo County, when we find sites that date to this time period, we, we might call them the Diablo phase because they will correlate. They'll have the same artifacts, the same foods were being eaten and so we're able to start to narrow things down from a larger region to a much smaller local level and so um, up in Cambria we also have um, uh, the Little Pico Creek is a creek up there just before Hearst Castle and we have a Little Pico Creek phase based off of excavations that Caltrans did there and so here's Little Pico Two successive middle Holocene phases in the San Luis Obispo and Big Sur areas. So here's another thing that archaeologists use, and that's trying to compare different sites locally to each other. And then once we're able to identify those, we can start answering all kinds of different questions. Were the people at Little Pico trading with the people from Diablo Canyon? And then we can look for certain artifacts, and we can look to see changes in the food that they're eating. Maybe at the beginning of the Little Pico phase, they're eating seals but maybe they over harvested those seals and then there was no more seals in the archeological record. So we can start to identify and answer a lot of different questions. 
Um, anyway, so that's sort of where all these dating techniques and all these, um, all the different archeological work that's being conducted can come together and we can start really saying something about what's going on. Because you start from a real general, a real general um, description of, an, of a region and then we wanna know more about what's happening in Morro Bay. This is where we live, we, what's, what's going on right here? And so here in Morro Bay, we have um, this, um, this example I've been showing you guys has um, something very interesting. I think you guys, especially most of you who are interested in, the, um, in all the amazing bird and animal life we have here in Morro Bay, this is what they had found in the archeological site, all the bones. So they do these faunal analysis. They take all the bones that they recover, they take them into a lab and they, and they figure out what species there were. So you can see all these different birds were found in the site. Um, so if you look at the numbers there, um, the most duck was the most common thing found. So that makes sense. Duck is probably the tastiest of all those birds. So they're eating ducks. You can go down, you, they had like, wow, there's a lot of reptiles in the, in the site as well. And maybe they're eating snakes. Um, we have some sea otter, some sea lions, a lot of rodents. Um, some of the rodents may have been found in the site naturally, such as ground squirrels. They're always living in the ground. But a lot of the other animals were definitely hunted and eaten. And so we also have the ubiquitous shell midden. And so um, these shell, shell middens um, were usually the most uh, obvious sign of an archeological site in Morro Bay or Los Osos. And um, we have all these different shell species. And so what's interesting about Morro Bay is we have the estuary where you have things like oysters, um, moon snails, um, and then you have the open coast. You have both the rocky reefs where you would have abalone and mussels, and you have the sandy beaches where you'll have clams. So there's all these three different types of um, region of uh, environment where we're getting our shells from. And you can see they were uh, pretty much probably eating everything that you would find out there today. And this is also, also interesting to note that 8,000 years ago, we have the same animals and the same shells that we do now. So that's um, another interesting thing. And then if we do find species that are in that, in that assemblage that are not present now, that can tell us something. Well, wow, there used to be pronghorn sheep around here um, and, the, and the natives would eat them. So a lot of different things, um, once we're able to narrow down and get our dating and get our, our um, time period um, well established, that we can really start to address all these different things, such as um, how humans impacted their environment. We know that uh, things were changing over time in the, not just the climate, but due to human um, you know, impacts on the earth. You know, we have controlled burning, prescribed burning for one is one of the most obvious ones and then overhunting, and then um, maybe the introduction of other plants from elsewhere. Um, they were not agriculturalists as we know. The California Native Americans were essentially hunter gatherers. We like to call them foragers um, nowadays, but um, there can be a stigma with hunting and gathering people, but uh, they were nevertheless very intelligent and uh, an amazing, amazing cultural development occurred throughout this, the many, many thousands of years. Um, so that's pretty much what I was gonna talk about today.